Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar series, ELFA Wednesday Webinars at 1. I'm Heather Staverman, Director of Meetings and Exhibits for the Equipment Leasing and Finance Association. On behalf of ELFA, it is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar, Cybersecurity and Fraud in the COVID-19 Environment. With concerns about protecting data and avoiding fraud higher than ever in the current environment, ELFA has asked three of our member authorities to speak to a few main areas within this topic framework. Tom Ware, Dominic Libertore, and Andrew Cotter will highlight some key points and give us their guidance on preventative measures to combat fraud, red flags to watch for, and how you can protect your business and data in this ever more technology-based environment. Our session today is being recorded and will be available to replay later this week. If you have a question for our speakers, please type it into the questions feature on the right hand side of your screen. We'll leave time for question and answer after the presentation and address as many questions as time allows. Please allow me to introduce each of our panelists. First, we'll welcome Tom Ware, president of Tom Ware Advisory Services, who will be speaking to us today from the credit and operations side. Tom has over 30 years experience in small business lending, working with banks and finance companies. He has held a variety of credit and general management positions throughout his esteemed career, as well as an 18 year tenure with Paynet. Tom has now opened his own consulting firm and focuses on equipment finance companies and alternative lenders, data and analytics. In addition, Tom serves as the chairman of the research committee for the Equipment Leasing and Finance Foundation and as a trustee and member of its executive committee. Also, Tom is a longstanding member of the ELFA Credit and Collections Committee. Next, we will welcome Dominic Libertore, Deputy General Counsel with DLL, a global provider of leasing and business finance solutions, including vendor finance, who will be addressing the legal issues, red flags, and briefly addressing e-signing and e-leasing. Dominic has been practicing law for 30 years, focusing in the areas of leasing and asset-based lending, and has served in a variety of senior in-house legal positions with DLL. Dominic is a past chairman of the ELFA Legal Committee and is a frequent speaker at industry events. And then, Andrew Cotter, Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Somerset Capital Group, will round out today's web seminar with a discussion on cybersecurity and technology. Andrew has been with Somerset Capital Group since 2002 and is primarily responsible for providing vision and leadership to develop and implement information technology initiatives related to business, finance, and operation systems. Andrew is the past chairman of the ELFA Operations and Technology Committee, a member of the ELFA Technology Innovation Workgroup, and is a frequent speaker at industry events. Welcome Andrew, Dominic, and Tom, and thank you for joining us. And now with a reminder to participants to type questions into the question feature on your GoToWebinar screen, I'll turn the program over to Mr. Ware. Tom? Well, thank you, Heather, for that very kind introduction. It's appreciated. Um, so I'm going to start with, with kind of a, an overview of, of fraud that uh, I think in general, any action requires both desire and ability. Uh, and today, both, of, both are up. There is more desire and more ability uh, among fraudsters to uh, uh, do their thing uh, in the last couple of months. Fraud has all sorts of, uh, really is a spectrum, and there are kind of all sorts of flavors and types and kinds of it. But I, I think it really falls into three broad categories. Uh, the first being total fraud, which is really theft. It's plain and simple. There was never any intention to pay. Uh, and it can be done by obligors or intermediaries or, or both combined, colluding. Uh, partial fraud uh, is the, the other second main category. And this is really, it's lying. And it's lying to entice a lender to do something that they probably wouldn't do if, if they really knew what was going on. But the obligor intends to repay if they can, which is questionable many times. 
Uh, the risk is very high, and, and it, it's certainly uh, something that, that we all want to avoid. Um, all types of fraud, fraud we want to avoid. Um, the third category uh, I call technical fraud. Um, and some people might not consider this to be fraud at all. And, and it's something that happens uh, in documentation and, and funding. And uh, you know, a classic example is one person signs for another person, uh, or people say that equipment is delivered when it really isn't. And there's no uh, intent to defraud, and there's no, it's really just convenience uh, and, and ex expediency. And uh, they, they generally don't understand that they're causing a problem later on, potentially. So next slide, please. So uh, getting to, uh, so with total fraud. Now, uh, with so many businesses unemployed, uh, people unemployed and businesses shuttered, there's going to be uh, a lot more motivation. Um, and, you know, the, the, one of the classic tricks of, of, of fraudsters is to pretend to be some established business, a, bro a borrower or a dealer that they're not. Um, and in this environment with, with uh, businesses closed temporarily and people working from home, it, it's going to be a lot easier to sort of play those, those tricks. Uh, in the commercial space, which, which often leads the, the – uh, excuse me, in the consumer space, which often leads the uh, commercial, uh, I know that there are uh, fraudsters out there who literally go out and create hundreds of identities uh, of fictitious people and live their lives and make auto loan payments, etc., and then harvest them all at once after a couple of years. And uh, the commercial world is, is, has their, their own equivalent. It's, it's not quite as sophisticated and, and large scale, but it's very, very real. The, the uh, generally known as pump and dump, uh, when a borrower will do a series of deals, uh, two, three, four, more in a row, and then all of a sudden disappear. Uh, we've also heard from lenders uh, cases of things like synthetic websites, spoof emails, spoof phone numbers, emails being hacked to send fraudulent payment instructions out. That's a scary one. So, Next slide, Heather, please. So uh, I, it, it pains me to say this. It's not something that I would normally say, but, but I think this is probably a good time to temporarily reduce uh, or even eliminate automation, that, uh, that the, the sort of checks and balances are so different uh, and the need is so great. Um, uh, I'll also say, and, and, and I have no personal stake in this whatsoever, but that it's a real good time to pull more reports from people like PayNet and LexisNexis and secretaries of state and, and other information providers generally, uh, and uh, really look very carefully at things like names, addresses, how they change over time, how do they match up to the information that's being presented to you. Uh, I've also heard lenders... Uh, protecting themselves very effectively with Google Earth, uh, satellite view and street view, and they've caught you know, businesses that are boarded up buildings, that are P.O. boxes, that are something other than they're pretending to be. Uh, there's also available a lot of uh, services for online digital uh, verifications, phone numbers, other kinds of information that's good to utilize. Uh, in general, funding is not the place to make credit decisions, or absolutely it's not, but it, it is an ideal place to, to catch many types of, of fraud. Um, one, one preventative mechanism that, that runs through my mind, and this is a, a very old-fashioned thing, but uh, 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 consider maybe getting a first payment check in advance with, with a corporate check. That used to be uh, considered a, a degree of protection. Uh, I also think it's it's really important for lenders to try to to monitor the magnitude of uh, frauds in their portfolio, and uh, first payment defaults I, I think work as a really good proxy. That uh, I'm not saying that they're all frauds, but how many people really take out a loan and don't make one single payment? Um, and it actually may understate the number of frauds too, because there'll be frauds where, as I said before, they take out two, three, four loans and make a couple of payments before uh, before disappearing. But it's it's still it's it's a good way to to monitor uh, uh, as a proxy what the, what the frauds are. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, it's also super important to, to monitor the performance of vendors, other deal sources, not just sort of delinquency and default, but also the, the, the quantity of deals, the you know, potential for rapid run-up, the quality of deals. You, know, you can use scores as a proxy for that and just see, see how that plays out over time and, and keep a close eye on that. Uh, and beware of rapid run-ups. So next, next uh, slide, please. So partial fraud. Now, historically, that this isn't hasn't been as much as a, a problem, I don't think, as total frauds have. Um, you know, however, you know, today with so many businesses shuttered, uh, I've got to think that there's going to be a huge temptation for otherwise honest people to pretend to finance equipment. Um, just to get cash and to, to meet whatever needs they have. I, I know of one chief credit officer who said he's uh, put in policies specifically to, to test for this or to try and prevent this uh, on every, do, every new deal that's being originated. Um, Stay-at-home orders also make collateral inspections, uh, if not more difficult, uh, well, if not impossible, certainly more difficult. And uh, you know, keep in mind in this that uh, oftentimes the, these you know, fake deals where, the, where there really isn't equipment, that there's collusion between the, the vendors and brokers involved, and they've got to be suffering their own cash flow problems these days. Uh, I know a lot of lenders are asking the question to, to new borrowers, and I, I would be really tempted to ask too, you know, why would you want to add additional equipment now, given the circumstances? And certainly there have got to be cases where it makes a lot of sense, but uh, I, I think it's, it's worth asking. Um, you know, a classic uh, story that, that, that I heard years ago, true story, um, is of a deal that was for a daycare center that happened to be on the, the border of Mexico. And uh, what they were financing was a backhoe. And it's like, wait a minute, what do you think is going to happen to that backhoe? Where is that backhoe going to go to? Um, pretty pretty uh, obvious when you stop and think about it. And just in general, that I think it's a good idea to uh, be suspicious of deals where the equipment type is not use, uh, common for that type of business. I mean, it's a um, you know something that you you can you know, really use your data to uh, see what's common and what's not, and, and flag those that are um, uh, uncommon for the industry type. Another thing to watch out for also is is substantial geographic distance between a vendor and a borrower that doesn't have some logical reason. Um, you know, maybe, maybe if it's an IT vendor that they're the only one in the, the country, okay, maybe. But um, but uh, a lot of these deals also are, are straw purchases, um, these sort of partial frauds where uh, the, the real borrower is a friend or a relative because the, the person who really wants to the, 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 the loan or lease is uh, a poor credit or, or very little credit. A classic trip also is uh, uh, fraudsters financing the same asset many different times, um, sometimes simultaneously. Um, and it, that's actually something for, that happens with both partial fraud and total fraud. Next slide, please. So, um, Clearly, painting a rosier picture uh, for a lender improves a chance of approval. And uh, back in 2013, the alternative lenders had what, what they call the summer of fraud um, when they were approving uh, transactions based on bank, bank statements that applicants had submitted. And the, the applicants were submitting them directly, and they were doctoring them. And it was a huge problem. They lost a lot of money. And uh, from that, uh, policies have changed. They still get bank statements, but they get them directly through a service like Yodely. It's permission-based, but, it, but uh, the information is coming from the bank uh, itself, so it can't be doctored. It also might mitigate the risk of a fraudulent identity. Um, in general, this is a good time for funding staff to, to spend more time really examining the equipment, uh, the description, the age, is it says it's new, but is it really used? How reasonable are the values um, on the invoices? And do the invoices look doctored? And someone was telling me about a crooked uh, catching a deal because things didn't line up correctly on an invoice. There's also a uh, app out there called TruePick that uh, some lenders use to perform secure virtual equipment inspections. I, I think that, that that could be very useful. Um, 
in general, that, that uh, as much as one wants to increase due diligence, that, that you can't necessarily do everything on every deal. And, and so you need to differentiate by industry and by asset type. IT equipment is one in particular to, to uh, watch for because it, it's fertile ground for fraudsters that uh, values are subjective and it's kind of hard to verify uh, technological capabilities. Um, obviously, and, and uh, goes without saying, look more closely at deals from, from restaurants and retailers and bars and hotels and things if that's uh, um, clearly a, a red flag just originating at all. And uh, uh, it strikes me that for these partial fraudsters, not not for total fraudsters, but partial fraudsters, it's possible personal guarantees might dissuade some of these that they do intend to repay, but they know that there's a risk and that uh, uh, substantial risk. They, they might be a little dissuaded from the, the lender that requires that. So, next slide, please. Last of the three categories, what I call technical fraud, um, it, if not pre premeditated and uh, people don't really realize that they, they're causing a problem. And I think this could also be on the rise for a totally different reason. And that's simply the fact that, that uh, people aren't co-located now. They're working from home. And so having one person sign for another or maybe there's no one in, in the uh, office or, or uh, store to, to verify the equipment was delivered. So um, just the... the uh, stay at home could make this more rampant. Um, DocuSign and other electronic documents would certainly prevent this or, or reduce the risk, as does getting copies of driver's licenses and things like that. Um, and you'll hear more about that soon from Dominic. Um, in general, it strikes me it'd also be a, a reasonable time to try to get information on where people live. I mean, that virtually speaking, that uh, uh, if people are working remotely and, and documents or equipment is going to or from there that uh, it's kind of de facto a part of the, the footprint of the business and certainly not going to be easy to get this information. They're not going to be thrilled about it, but it seems pretty reasonable to me to ask. Next slide. Just some closing general thoughts. Um, you know, there's, there's absolutely no silver bullet panacea, I don't think, that uh, increasing fraud um, Prevention requires more work and more time. Uh, culturally, I, I think that uh, is something to, to uh, think about is to, to instill a, a culture of, of communication that, you know, what's kind of being lost is, is the funding specialist leading over to his or her neighbor and saying, hey, does this look funny to you? And is, is that conversation going to happen if people feel they have to pick up the phone? Um, so, you know, the more one can have a, uh, a culture of over communication to overcome silos um, and really question anything odd. I think that's very good. I've also had uh, some lenders tell me that they've effectively used Microsoft Teams within defar departments to uh, foster better communication. Uh, another approach, uh, and it, I guess maybe transaction size is going to dictate the feasibility of this, is is to have uh, the same person look at the vendor the collateral, the credit, and the documentation, really get a holistic view of the deal is uh, you know, one, one sort of prevention that, that I think could be very effective that uh, you know, to some extent some of these frauds slip by because the left hand doesn't really know all the details of the right hand. And if you saw the whole thing, you could sort of smell a rat. Um, the, in general, I think the lenders should demand stronger protective processes and transaction terms today, given the, the added risk of lending now. Uh, I think that that's reasonable. Uh, there's a, a great article, a much more comprehensive, comprehensive list of things to, to, to look for by uh, attorney Andy Alper uh, in the monitor, and there's a link in the, uh, uh, in the presentation we have here. You can also just Google it. Uh, finally, I want to close with, with uh, a quote um, from uh, Bill Verhaley, the CEO of QuickFi, uh, and uh, uh, about really the future of fraud prevention and, and his view of where things are going, because I think it's very interesting. Um, and it, it, it requires technology that isn't obviously going to uh, be adopted overnight, but, but it does exist. And uh, uh, Bill says, 
uh, until everyone in the industry adopts more secure mobile platforms with enhanced security ca capabilities, facial recognition, driver's license authentication, geolocation, device ID, and two-factor text and company email authentications, we anticipate increasing fraud activity for the declining number of lenders still using web portals to consummate loan and lease transactions. So with that, I will pass it over to Dominic Liberatore, Deputy General Counsel at DLL. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. My co-panelists and I also want to just briefly thank the audience for dialing in today um, in this web uh, uh, COVID-19 world. We're all pressed for time. We also would like to thank Ralph Petta, Lisa Ramirez, and also Lisa Moore for sponsoring this. And we simply can't thank Heather Staverman and Alexa Carnabella for the fabulous support. We were emailing um, changes to the presentation at almost 11 o'clock last night, and they were still there for us and doing a terrific job. So thank you so much. The, my piece of this session is to talk about some process and operational um, considerations to keep in mind in the COVID-19 world. You know, fraud in the digital world can arise in a bunch of different digital sort of feeling things. It could be as simple as some emails, even if you're doing paper-based leases. It could be e-signed leases. It could be uh, full-blown e-leases. Funders are getting smarter. They're using higher tech. It's becoming more difficult to detect what they're doing. So again, the goal of this part of our session is to give you some practical thoughts, how you can combat or avoid some of that fraud risk. I wanted to include some email uh, fraud examples, although Andrew's gonna hit those in more depth in a few minutes. So just wanted to mention that because email is pretty much involved no matter what type of leasing you're doing nowadays. But some of the things you're gonna hear out there is phishing and spoofing and just plain phony emails with phony links. I try to include some definitions, but it, it occurs to me, although they're used often confusingly or interchangeably, it doesn't really matter. They're all bad things. So just wanted to highlight some of the things. And again, Angie's gonna drill down a little bit more about that. Uh, next slide, please. Paperless leases and paperless uh, um, transactions, loans, et cetera, are a lot more commonplace now than they were a few years ago. I'm proud to say that Ralph and Alpha led an outreach a few years ago to uh, drill down on that, that particular medium for offering leasing. But as we all know, given the COVID-19 world, most of our members are working remotely. So this means a lot more e-signing and a lot more e-leasing. This trend is going to absolutely continue. We see that from seeing the other vertical finance areas out there. Of course, a paperless trend, a paperless leasing and loans are a good thing. But it does create the opportunities for bad actors to commit fraud because most of the, the transactions are no longer face to face. And as Tom just said, you don't even have the ability to walk next door to talk to your colleagues quite so easily. Uh, they're all replaced by electronic ones now. Just think about how different this is from just five or six or 10 years ago. The whole world's changing. Okay, I'm gonna talk about e-signing and full-blown e-leases a little bit during this presentation. I would say that, um, oops, I just lost the webinar. Hang on guys, just went blank. I don't know what happened here. Suspect that's me and not, uh, apologies. I don't know why I just lost everybody. Oh, I'm back, apologies. Um, when I say e-signing, I mean there is electronic signature, typically by the customer, to a paper-based lease. When I say full-blown e-leasing, I mean it's typically signed by everybody electronically, and it automatically is sent to an electronic vault. So the real key distinction is, is it being sent to a full-blown electronic vault by some third party? Yeah, we'll drill down um, at our electronic leasing session next week on some of that, but that'll be important for part of the remarks I'm gonna make. Don't get me wrong, if e-leasing or e-signing is done properly, it's not only as secure, in my view, it's more secure than paper leasing, 
but it's easy to get complacent in the digital world. I mean, there's sometimes a feel that, oh, it's all digital, it must be safe, and or you just can't stick your head around the corner and ask your colleagues about some stuff, and or it's a lot more difficult to actually see your customers face to face. As Tom mentioned, it's really impossible, it's really important to follow the process and follow the basics. Next slide, please. Some of the mechanical things you want to think about for protecting from fraud in the digital context, and I'm thinking mostly e-signing now. It could be both, and my comments will apply to the both, but we try to tailor this session and a lot of these, these sessions to what can you do in the short term to make a difference and be um, to react to some of the unique challenges of COVID-19. And let's face it, if you don't have an e-leasing program set up, you're probably not gonna be able to set one up in the next two or three or four weeks. It's probably at least a couple of months, but you can set up an e-signing process and you almost have to, frankly, given that we're all working remote. When you're setting up an e-sign process, some of the things you wanna think about when you're doing your due diligence is what kind of signer authentication processes they offer. And they all offer different ones and they have different levels. We're gonna come back to that in a couple of minutes. You want to think about the, the name recognition and the size and over, overall viability of your e-sign provider. If a company is called Tom and Dominic's e-signing is us, it might not be one that you want to run to. You want to think about their overall platform and their security protections. You want to think about what they offer for an audit trail. We're going to come back to that in a second. And if you think, and you should be thinking this, you're gonna be offering e-vaulting, maybe not during COVID-19, but if you're gonna be doing that, you wanna make sure that company has an e-vaulting e uh, transactional capability. Remember, there are lots of e-sign providers out there and the list keeps growing. I've been doing e-signing for an awful long time and there's names I hear that I've never heard of before. Some of them are pretty good. They've got some good operational components, they're not real well known. They probably will be. It's, you're going to see more entrance into the market, but you want to think about that. Another thing you want to think about, and this comes up a lot, is is the e-signing being done by the customer themselves through some type of homegrown uh, solution? That one always makes me nervous because, again, e-sign and UEDA, the state laws and the federal law, rather, for e-sign and UEDA is the state laws certainly are broad enough to pick up that to become a binding and forcible electronic signature. But how do you prove who signs it? How do you know who's hitting the accept button if you're not going through some well-established third party um, e-sign provider with, a, with a, a decent signer authentication process? In fact, to me, it raises some of the same issues that you see for signature stamps. If there's that stamp sitting on my desk and I go away, you don't know who picks it up and stamps it on something. Next slide, please. I mentioned the, um, the audit trail capabilities. It sometimes calls a certificate, certificate of completion. This is really important. A lot of people think, ah, that's just one of those cover sheet kind of things that people used to see for faxes, or it's some type of gobbledygook that the lawyers seem to want. It's actually not. That's gonna summarize who signed the lease, the date and time when they signed it, and their IP address. The IP address can be really important for enforcement. Not all IP addresses get you to where you want to. Some of them will get you to the building location, super helpful. Sometimes they only get you to, they only get you to um, the, who the carrier is. T-Mobile, AT&T, and so forth. It's super important to have them. Take a look at that when, you, when you're looking at these providers. I saw one a couple of weeks ago, and it looked like a high school diploma. It says, you know, Dominic Liberatory graduate. It said certificate of completion, and it said signed by Dominic Liberatory. And it didn't really give any background as to how they knew it was me. They did have an email address, and I guess that's as we'll talk about a little bit later on, that's certainly a first step, but the better ones have a lot more detail that's a lot more helpful. Another thing you wanna think about is 
whose eSign account is being used? I know that might sound like a funny question. Let's say you've got an account at DocuSign, big name. Let's say the customer has a, an account at DocuSign, even though it's the same, um, even though it's the same provider. It's not your account. So whoever owns that account may have set different um, a secure, a, a authentication levels. You know, maybe it's the customers, maybe it's the originating vendor. They might not be what you expect to see. Also, if it's not your account, they might not have checked the single authoritative copy process if you're doing full-blown e-leasing. Um, also, if it's not your account and you don't get the audit trail, you're not going to be able to go to the e-sign provider and say, hey, this isn't my account, but I also have an account with you. Can you get me the audit trail? Because at that point, that's the other, the account owner's information. It's not yours, and you're probably not entitled to it. Signer authentication. Um, a lot of companies offer similar things. You want to see what they do offer. Some of your offer options are going to be you'll, you'll email to your customer with a known email address. And then when they click on your email, there'll be a link in it that'll bring them to the eSign provider and they'll capture the information I mentioned before. That's sort of the lowest level and it may be just fine for a small ticket environment. Um, other options are two-step verification, such as a text with a code or a phone call on your cell phone with a code. There's also out-of-wallet identity check services. There's always a balance here and there's commercial pushback and there's you know risk and legal are saying we want more security and the commercial folks want to make sure that we keep the right balance in mind. We all get that. You know, you don't want to slow down or affect the, the uh, customer experience. Super important concerns, but in this day and age of fraud, you want to make sure, especially since we're not in the same office together, that you balance that. So my team, you know, we did some demos on some of this stuff. And one of them was the out of wallet identity check service. It was actually my colleagues in our Des Moines office. And they went on the site and they found out that it took them, I don't know, two, three minutes to do the out of wallet identity check questions. Super easy. Um, so it's not the long drawn out process of people. Some people fear. Also, I, I could be wrong with the exact amount, but I thought it was like $6 for per ID check. So Again, not big time, not big dollars. So maybe think about doing two different levels, one for small ticket and one for the bigger deals. Again, um, you want that balance. And in this day of less and less face-to-face, -face, that's important. Next slide, please. Some things you wanna drill down because no matter what form of, e of leasing you're doing, electronic, e-signing or all paper leasing, Somewhere in the process, you're gonna have emails involved. So the emails are really important. Really drill down on the email address. You wanna make sure it's one that you know well. If it's one you don't know well, or it looks a little funny, hover your cursor over the email. That might always be a good idea. And definitely do that before you click on any embedded links before you click. Also, you wanna use emails from an actual company's email domain. Look at the example up on the slide. I actually received that recently where somebody sent an email. Again, look at it, John Doe with the words at ABC um, at AOL.com. As opposed to John Doe at sign ABC.com. Now think back about 15 years ago before everybody had a cell phone and everybody had work laptops and all that good stuff. I know people sometimes late in the evening or on weekends might send things out a proposal or some responses, whatever. And they might wanna, you know, have that look like it's something tied to the business and or something that doesn't say liberatory family email at AOL.com. There's probably no reason to do that anymore. Also, everybody's got to sell nowadays. You wanna be wary of personal email addresses. Um, you might have a sole prop, so maybe there's some justification, but even then they tend to have some DBA tied to those email addresses, ask yourself, does your email look fishy? Does it have typos? Is it somehow off? In the old days, when I would get a, old days, three, four years ago, you get an email from somebody that you figured was probably scammy and it might have some funny circles or dots or, or accent marks over the, value, the vowels, or maybe it had a lot of typos, or maybe the syntax was just off. 
when I see those more recently, they're smooth. You got to think twice. There's one that came into my company to a real player. And again, I, I won't give the person's real name, but this person reached out to me because the email had said, uh, Amy, why don't you go ahead and fund this very large deal? We really need this to fund right away. And so Amy reached out to me and said, Dominic, I know you're a senior lawyer and all, but are you really asking me to pull the funding trigger? So we both laughed. And of course, we didn't do it. And it highlights, take the extra step. If something doesn't feel right, the law lawyers on my team don't send out those funding emails. We might send off on doc packages, but we don't send them out to say, go ahead and here's the funding, go ahead. Although we might approve the deal. Okay, one of the key things you wanna do is make sure you train your employees on basic tech issues. The kind of things we're talking about and that Angie's gonna talk about in a couple of seconds. You know, email security protections, IP addresses, um, secured site designations. You want to do those regularly. You might have new people. There might be some substantive development. And even if there's not, you just want to keep in front of your members and your employees to make sure they know the basics and you keep hearing the basics. Last slide, please. So whether you're dealing with emails and PDFs or even old-fashioned wet ink leases or e-signed or full-blown e-leases. As Tom said, use standard back office pro pro processes and standard due diligence and even do it for repeat business. Anybody that was at our annual conference in the fall, Paul Bent did a great job leading the session and we talked about it. It was a hypothetical where there was a scam involving repeat business where it was a division that didn't exist and they said to the uh, funder, hey, you already approved us and we approved your legal docs, uh, we can move real quick here. And it turned out to be a scam. So you gotta watch out for that. Remember common sense and due diligence are just as important in the digital world as the paper world. The guys out there are getting smarter and more shrewd and trickier. It's a constantly evolving threat. Remember, if you don't, if it doesn't feel right, it might not be, drill down, pick up the phone, call your colleague like Amy did, You know, go to the customer if you're able to with the, when the COVID world lifts, as Paul Ben said during our, our discussion, trust your instincts. It's always obvious. Unfortunately, it's obvious in hindsight. Well, that's it for my portion. I wanted to hand off the, 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 the presentation now to Andrew Cotter. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dominic. Go to the first slide, Heather. So we've all been through a lot to get here. Uh, our world has changed rapidly and we're dealing with new realities. Significant portions of our workforce are experiencing work from home for the first time. And our rigorous planning cycles uh, have been upended and our well thought out business continuity plans are now being stretched well beyond what they were written for. While there are many things that we've been asked to focus on, and our priorities are shifting, sometimes daily, now's the time to not cut uh, certain corners. Our adversaries are not letting up and security has never been more important. Next slide, please. As we went through this transition, organizations, including IT departments, uh, had to scramble from equipment shortages to training employees and new processes. Many of us had to move fast there are issues. Uh, what, what I've heard from people is ultimately things went well and we're able to operate. Great job to all of you out there. Depending on your organization, those quick laid plans may or may not have included a, a voice representing security. Uh, the constant balancing act of having too much security, which can be prohibitive versus too little, can open us up to more risk potentially uh, or potentially hinder business. These may not have been considered uh, and, and definitely something that we will uh, talk about here and will, will, um, should be addressed as you go forward. Next slide. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that security breaches are on the rise. 11% uh, increase last year, uh, according to Accenture. It seems like pre-COVID, there was some major breach in the news almost every week. 
Uh, there are many ways that bad actors attempt to gain access to our environments. Today I'll review four of those vectors, including the most pre prevalent, uh, phishing, the one that we most uh, hear about and experience. Next slide. The security field has come up with many names for various types of phishing. In general, a phishing attack starts with a request, an offer, or a plea. In the corporate environment, a phishing email can take many forms, such as a message from an HR department, an IT team asking for someone to click a link, enter a password. How these are sent and who they are sent to can vary significantly. Spear phishing is a very targeted email. Uh, whaling is when a bad actor goes after a high profile target, typically a, a someone in the C-suite. You know, messages can come via email, text, phone. Uh, they're creative and there never seems to be an end to how people are, are getting these and how creativity is uh, permeating these actors. One solid piece of advice from security researcher Brian Krebs is to hang up, look up, and call back. Now that can apply to any of the methods attacker use, whether it's email, text, or phone. This is one way to break that chain of events that were planned by the, the attacker. And I'll tell you this from listening to Brian Krebs speak, if he calls you and calls your organization, it's probably best that you actually answer the phone or call him back. He tends to have really good information and is really trying to protect you. Uh, good security researcher to follow. Next slide. How attacks are carried out can vary widely. The most common involve malicious URLs or links, uh, similar to uh, what Dominic mentioned around email addresses. They look familiar. They've been crafted just for that reason. And in this day and age when email inboxes are overflowing and time can be limited and distractions in our newfound home offices can be unending, careful review is needed. While the technique is not new by any means, registering domains that are relevant to people in light of what's going on is a great example of farming, the first one on the list. And many of us have experienced uh, and, and become victims of phishing, unfortunately, often many times in a year. Next slide. From mid-January until April, there was a significant uptick in domains that were registered that are related to COVID and coronavirus. This graph shows that at the peak, roughly 5,000 domains were registered daily that fit this profile. Domain tools helps analysts, such as Brian Krebs, turn data into threat intelligence. This analysis shows the disproportionate number of domains that potentially could be used to perpetuate fraud. As Tom mentioned earlier, not being in a cube or an office right next to another employee to ask about something looking out of place removes that easy check. Like they say, if you see something, say something. The amount of domains that are out there that are being used for malicious causes is clearly on the rise. Next slide. In times of a pandemic, people are hungry for information. In this example, malware spreading. Uh, that need was leveraged by attackers for both providing information on COVID, infections, and, and death in a live map. At the same time, people were trying to learn about the current state of infection, that website was attempting to spread malware. You can see from the graph that a spike in traffic from zero to more than 15,000 queries in just a matter of days. And while there was a sharp drop off, it did not go away totally and immediately. Tools were put in place. Uh, security researchers were finding this particular one out and alerted their systems to uh, to cut off access and to help prevent, in this case, uh, this at attacking other folks. How these bad actors um, build such malicious, malicious tools so rapidly, while many of us 
struggle to deploy systems in months and years is a question for another day, but something to appreciate nonetheless. Next slide. Ransomware, another very popular vector in the news, is significantly up, fortunately 500%. We'd like to see that in our business volume. Malware typically spread through phishing and that ultimately encrypts your data, your corporate files, and then demand a payment is made uh, is ransomware. These payments, if made due to the creation of certain blockchain-based currencies, can be untraceable and a significant concern to many in the security space. Uh, and unfortunately, things like ransom as, ransomware as a service have come around too. As you can see from the largest reports, uh, reported demands in 2019, this is not to be taken lightly. While there are ways to recover from such an attack, such as restoring backups, prevention is obviously prefer preferred. In today's world of cybercrime, old tools and methods are no match for those trying to exploit our systems. Thankfully, many vendors are taking new approaches. Machine learning and artificial intelligence is replacing lists of viruses and malware signatures but there's no single tool or process that can be effective with all these vectors and a layered approach is needed. Next slide. Advanced persistent threats are highly targeted and carefully planned. They can take weeks or months to evolve and they really involve three steps. The infiltration step, getting in the door, gaining access to your systems via email, uh, connecting to network devices or applications and file systems. Once they're in the door, they escalate and move laterally to insert malware to start gathering information, gathering other credentials and finding out where else they can move within your environment in, in terms of your network. Once they've identified as much as they can, they gather that information and start begin pulling it out of your network. This could go on for months and months. In a number of the breaches that are very public over the year, uh, past recent years, those have gone on for significant durations of time. There are a lot of things to look for, a lot of technical things to look for uh, to identify these, but ultimately it's unusual activity, whether it's logins, where those logins are, uh, where, what time of day, how often are they happening, or large pools of data that aren't normal within your environment. And then obviously, if you see large flows of data leaving your network, that's another indicator as well. Next slide. So I came up with an acronym for you to deal with some of these threats, especially in times uh, that we're dealing with now with COVID. And a nice little picture to uh, remember the acronym. Princess Leia, Leia. Leverage. Your companies have a process in place. Don't start from scratch. Leverage them and tailor them in light of COVID. Evaluate. Having a ro robust strategy for security requires varying degrees of focus at the best of time. After the top priorities have been dealt with, continue on to the second and third priority. Implement. It's not enough to just look at what you have and create a to-do list. You have to make a plan and deploy the necessary changes and assess. Once you're done, unfortunately you are not. You're back at the beginning, evaluate what you've done and continue to monitor how the landscape has changed. The world's not standing still. New threats have come around. Next slide. In the world of security, uh, cybersecurity is an idea of um, cyber security hygiene. Dominic mentioned training and that culture of awareness, making sure you engage with your employees to know what they should do. You've got business continuity plans. Now's a great time to review them. And monitoring, widening the scope of an organization wide monitoring activity, particularly for data and endpoints, is important for two reasons. Cyber attacks have proliferated, and basic boundary protections such as proxies, web gateways, uh, network intrusion systems, firewalls, 
they won't secure users anymore being at home or not as easily. Patch management is, is something you should always keep up on, not something to fall behind because vulnerabilities will be exploited in hardware and applications. And an easy one to overlook is your external relationships. While you have your house in order, potentially, hopefully, make sure that you make it a part of your procurement process and ongoing review to look at those third parties. Who is that next open door into your network, into your system? Next slide. Couple quick, easy things to do. One, don't let your family members use your computer. Hopefully it's a policy at work easy to do when you're at home all the time. Lock your computer when it's not in use. Who is uh, has a pet at home that their cat has jumped up? If you've been on video meetings, it's been happening all over the place. Don't let your cat, your dog, your parrot, whatever, walk all over your keyboard. Who knows what will happen? Physical document. In the office, employees have ready access to digital document sharing mechanisms as well as shredders and secure deposit bins uh, for printed materials at home where employees might lack the same resources. Sensitive information can end up in the trash, set norms for the retention and destruction of physical copies, even if that means waiting until you're back in your office. And multiple uh, factor authentication has been mentioned multiple times. It is not, uh, if you're not already done, please begin using multi-factor authentication, both personally and in corporate environments. It's not ironclad, it's a good defense. And your employees are your last line of defense. Be diligent in your approach to security, engage with your partners, and do not ignore what needs to be done. Also as important is realize that your employees, like all of us, have been going through many different things. Our families, our jobs, our economy have been upended and anxiety is high. Remember to check on your staff, and do everything you can to take care of them. And now I'll turn it back over to Heather for our question and answer time. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you everyone, that was wonderful. As Andrew said, uh, we're going to go ahead and take some questions. Uh, the graphic here shows you submit your questions in the questions panel and then we will um, relay those over to our panelists. I do have a couple questions that I'd like to read aloud. I think they've been answered within the panel, but I'd like to read them out loud for everyone, um, just in case we have some phone listeners as well. Um, Tom, it looks like this one question is for you and maybe a double-ended question here. So we'll start with this one. Tom, are there various regions where you find more fraud deals than others? Okay. I, I don't have any recent information as to what's going on right now, but uh, historically and, and over the long term that there have really been more frauds in warm weather states, uh, states with lots of transients, uh, states with densely populated areas. So more fraud in, in Miami and Los Angeles than in North Dakota. Okay, great. And then to follow along with that, how about within specific industry? You know, that's that's tough to say, partially because a fraudster can pretend to be in any industry that they, they want to be in. Um, but uh, in, in general, I think I, I've seen just in my career more fraud in, you know, what I'd call white collar industries with indoor equipment, IT equipment, things like that, than in, in blue collar industries with outdoor equipment like construction, transportation, agriculture and mining. Um, and maybe that's simply because it's harder to, to fake being in those uh, outdoor industries. You need more uh, equipment to, to, to do that, uh, but it, it can really happen in any industry. Sure. That's been my experience also, Tom. But. All right. Well, thank you all very much. We will um, all be sure to be safe in more ways than one these days. Um, but thank you for highlighting some areas that we can look at technologically um, and make sure that we are extra safe while staying at home and keeping our businesses safe as well. It was a fantastic discussion for everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thank you all for joining us as well. I hope you had a few helpful takeaways um, that you can remember and put into practice at uh, your own new desks these days. 
again, a reminder, the session was recorded and we will be able to, um, you will receive a link to replay later this week. The, you will also receive a survey email tomorrow from ELFA. Please take a moment to fill out that survey. It's a quick survey to just kind of give us an idea if this information was helpful and um, our wonderful speakers um, will be able to craft their messages going forward as well, because this kind of thing changes daily, we all know. Uh, join us next week as well for the ELFA Wednesday webinars at 1. On May 6th, we will be going over e-signatures and e-leases in the COVID-19 world. Uh, we will be holding a webinar every Wednesday um, for quite some time. We have a schedule up and through June, so be sure to check in with us on Wednesdays, and uh, we will see you all then. Thank you all. Be well, safe, and healthy. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you.